Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Into the Impossible podcast. I'm your fearful host, Brian Keating co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego. And on this podcast, we talk about uh, very uh, numerous ideas and, and opinions. We talk about very painful divorces, uh, medication, medical uh, lapses in, in our guest's history. No, we don't, we don't actually do that. I don't, <laughs> I, I, don't want I was going to say, I will, <laughs> the Arthur C. Clarke, I didn't know he was so fascinated by all that stuff. Uh, so James and I actually met six years ago uh, this year, five and a half years ago in November of 20. So first of all, my guest is James Altucher, none other than the famous James Altucher, host of the James Altucher Show on, uh, on the interwebs. And I actually met James uh, back in 2014. We were both the stage here at uh, San Diego's very own TEDx um, uh, centerpiece. And actually, it was very uh, awkward for me, James, as I was tweeting to some of my friends today. Um, I felt kind of, you know, torn at that moment because you were the final speaker. You were the lead up to everybody uh, on that day. So I was kind of a warm up act, but I was sandwiched between you at the very end, author of The Power of No, and another author by, uh, by the name of William Uri, or Uri, uh, who wrote Getting to Yes. And I kind of felt like yeah. I was back, you know, the child of divorced parents. And who was I going to side with, you know, James or or uh, or William? And he also had his daughter on and she had set the record for, you know, a plank, holding the plank position longer than I could, you know, remain in bed. And this wonderful, very inspirational young lady uh, was on stage demonstrating how to hold the plank. And I still haven't, you know, been able to get up to more than 12 <laughs> seconds. I set a personal best though. Um, so I've had uh, I've had a deep desire to get uh, to get James on the podcast. He wouldn't come on, he said, until I actually did an interview with an astronaut while she was on the space station. So I checked that off in January, and then he said uh, he wouldn't come on until he had uh, until I had on uh, you know one of the world's most successful investors of all time, James Simons. And actually, there are connections between uh, James and James Simons, uh, reputedly called the world's uh, smartest billionaire. And James uh, Simons, Jim Simons, as we call him, he will be our guest um, Father's Day episode. So depending on when you're listening to this, uh, you can either go back or forwards in time if, if that suits you. And uh, actually, before I had uh, Jim Simons on, I asked Jim Altucher whether or not uh, he had any questions because it was rumored that he was the guest that he would most like to have uh, to pick his brains, at least when it came to investor geniuses. And yeah, so, I don't know if he's ever been on any podcast, right? No, I think I have the first. Very secretive. Uh, yes, he is. He's very secretive. It was a very intimate interview, very personal, and I uh, can't wait to share it with the world. Uh, but so I checked that off the box. Now James said he'd come on the show. And he gave me a question to ask uh, Dr. Jim Simons, and I did ask him that. And after that, he's never been on a podcast, but now he's gonna, he wants to start a podcast with you as the first guest. So James Altucher, welcome. This is a long winded way. Welcome to the, to the, into the impossible podcast. Thank you so much. I've been such a huge fan of yours for years, actually. Well, so. Brian, I'm a fan of yours. I mean, everybody should, should read your book, uh, uh, on almost losing the Nobel prize or losing, losing, losing the Nobel, the Nobel prize. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you came on my podcast recently and it's just such a fascinating conversation. I've been thinking about it ever since. I kind of want to get a PhD in physics now. I've been reading all about Einstein and, and you know, <laughs> it's exciting. Yeah, speaking of that, actually, I was listening to a podcast that you must have recorded it a couple of days on the James Altucher show before you and I got together because you were going over your tips for how to run a successful podcast and actually how you speed read. And you went through this, um, you went through an exercise. You basically taught people how to use uh, these tricks and tools that you've developed. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the show notes of this podcast. But one of the podcasts was like, uh, or one of the tips for speed reading was like, basically, you don't need to know the whole paragraph. That's your thesis. You read the first sentence, maybe the last sentence, because nobody really cares. You said verbatim about, you know, the boring details of what happened 13 billion years ago in the Big Bang. And nobody really can. The author is probably not that good because, you know, he's a nonfiction writer. You, oh, no. I'm not I'm not going to mention. <laughs> so I thought to myself, well, that's really high praise that you were using me as a cautionary example. No, no, no. Here's think about it in terms of like 
an academic, like academic research. And I, it's funny because I, I just was doing another podcast with um, some academics and we were talking about, are there too many academic research articles published per year? You know, there's about 3 million scientific research articles published per year. And my point there is, if you read the abstract and the summary, you know what the article is about. You don't need to read all the math. That was really my point mm -hmm. in that one is that yeah. for me, a layman, you know, I, I was looking at an article about the, you know, dynamic moving blah, blah, blah of a, go a human golf swing. And there's all this math in it. I just want to know how to move a golf right. club better. So, and, and my point is most, when I read fiction, I try to read every word because if I'm reading fiction, I'm reading it for, to, to be a better writer. Fiction writers, almost by definition, are the best writers. They're focused, they focus their careers on writing. Other, you know, if I'm reading, um, and I'll, I'll even specifically use an example. If I'm reading, well, maybe I, I shouldn't use an example. If I'm reading uh, uh, somebody's history book, you know, they wrote and they spent 30 years researching, they're experts on history. They're not experts on writing. Writing's a hard skill, but, and so is history. So I'll, I want to know the history, but they're not going to be the best writers. So sometimes they're going to use extra words. Their paragraphs are not going to be as formed as well as possible. But I will say, I, I almost never, ever speed read because I do think for, to prepare for a podcast, it's important to read everything. It's in some situations, and I've been managing my schedule better this past year, some situations in prior years, I would have five or six podcasts scheduled in a week. I'd have to read just too many books. And like, if you have Nassim Taleb on, and he's written <laughs> four books all worth reading, but they're all kind of dense. I'm not, I can't read every word. No like, way. I, so I was really kind of referring to his yeah. books actually. No, it was actually a wonderful uh, example actually. And something that you might not know just because you're not in academia, <clears throat> but um, one of the things that happens most often is you'll write a paper, you'll put, you know, a month into a single sentence, and then I'll have a citation. And then a couple weeks after it uh, gets posted to the what's called the archive or the, uh, the, you know, the preprint server, we used to call it. It's really like a way to bypass paid journals. And I want to get into that with you in, in, in a little bit. Uh, but, uh, but then you'll get an email from a crank you know, or a friend, you didn't cite my paper. And uh, I feel, you know, like this is really relevant. And, uh, and, and you don't know, this person could be the referee and this, you know, you have no idea. We're going to get into gatekeeping, uh, choosing not yourself in academia in a little bit. But one tip that you gave in that podcast about reading nonfiction was very pertinent. And that's, you know, what, what do authors love the most when you read the acknowledgments, when you read the footnotes? And, and yeah. I thought I could do you one better uh, because I actually think the highest level of compliment, and tell me if you agree, is when you find a typo in a, in a very well uh, a popular book, a book that sold millions of copies uh, that's called The Power of No. And when you find a typo in that book, uh, or maybe even an error, is, isn't that the best thing for an author to hear that a reader has found a typo in his or her book? Hmm. That's a difficult question because on the one hand, it does demonstrate uh, an acuity of reading that I, I appreciate and I'm glad that one did, but I don't, I don't, I don't like to know that I made any errors. So more, it's still probably more interesting to me to be asked about who's in the acknowledgements. Um, but I'll have to try that trick uh, on, you know, a few future podcast guests and see what happens. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, for academic papers, though, if you find like, you know, that's kind of equivalent to finding like a flaw in the math. Yeah. And I've done that a couple of times as well. And again, the response is sort of mixed. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did find a typo in uh, The Power of No, which I'll, I'll send to you. It's, uh, yes, I don't, well, please do. I will. I will. It's uh, on page 85. You call uh, Isaac, you talk, speak about uh, the importance of leaving your family behind. And you talk about the examples in the Bible, you know, when Abraham left his father and the squabbles of, of siblings, because you want to give people the power to really uh, be empowered themselves and say no sometimes means saying no to your family. And you say that Isaac and Ishmael, or sorry, you say Isaac and Isaiah fought with each other, but Isaiah was not the brother of Isaac. So it's Ishmael. I will send yeah. that to you. Yeah, and, right. So Isaiah was a prophet in prophets that's or right actually, maybe he had his own book named after him i forget yes but, he did uh, yep yeah so and uh you're right yeah i don't yep. that's a, that's a that's a pretty bad one i don't know because i'm pretty familiar for whatever i 
I'm pretty familiar with the Bible and I, and, and I, I like these yeah. various structures. In the I want to, I want to get to that. Cause yeah, you use it as an exemplar. I mean, I always say I'd kill for 1% of God's book sales, you know, that would be great. <laughs> uh, something that had to appeal to people say 3000 years ago, even nobody disputes that academic scholars that it's historically ancient. Uh, and it still, but if you look at both the old Testament and the new Testament, it's kind of interesting how many people abandoned their their fathers yeah like you oh, know it's called even fathers in, yeah mm -hmm. e even in the new testament uh you know jesus says to i believe peter you know peter is like burying his his father and <laughs> jesus says let the dead bury the dead follow me and yeah. so it's it's kind of a weird thing and, and we know now that there's you know of course there's multiple authors of the new testament we also know now there's multiple authors of the old testament it's just odd that this was like a common theme but it happens to abraham isaac Jacob, it happens Joseph. to Joseph. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So Joseph uh, uh, was Sports. sort of he was sort of a, he didn't abandon Jacob, but he was kind of kicked out. And well, then, he does have a chance. You know, he's the second. I don't want to get too nerdy on the Bible, but yeah. he he becomes basically the second in command to Pharaoh for right. seventeen years. He doesn't contact his father to say I'm alive. Uh, he waits until his brothers happen by happenstance come to to Egypt. But right. Yeah, I want. I do want to talk about your connection to Judaism, and you, you mention it a lot. And as a practicing but not orthodox, I, I never want to like burden other Orthodox Jews with the sentiment that I'm an Orthodox oh, Jew. But, oh, and but, I'm not even. I'm not even practicing. I mean, no, I haven't I practiced my entire life. Yeah, yeah. So I do want to talk about that and Israel, and you know, some other uh, very light topics. I'm sure, but but we'll <laughs> we'll do that at the end. Uh, for now, I wanted to get started. You know, kick things off with uh, going back to that night in November of uh, 2014. We shared yeah. the stage at uh, TEDx San Diego, which is really something I look for, for, forward to doing, you know, since they came up with the concept of TED, uh, of TED Talks. Um, but you really, you know, kind of set the stage on fire with your characteristic vulnerability. It was right after Choose Yourself had come out, you know, a year or so afterwards, yeah. Power of No had come out. And, uh, and I saw you and, uh, and your then uh, wife, Claudia, I believe. Uh, yeah. You guys were in the green room. We hung out and I was like, yeah, I'll see you after the show. And then you ghosted me, James. I haven't seen this is the first time face to face uh, that we've been. So what what is your story about that? What do you recall about that night? And yeah, uh, would well, you do well, it again? <laughs> I I would because I think I'm a I think I'm a much different public speaker than I was then. But I was that was a big TEDx. That's like one of the big TEDx's. And there was I don't know. There was like I felt like maybe there was five hundred or a thousand or more people there. I have no idea how many people more, were there. There was fifteen hundred people. Fifteen hundred. I was so unbelievably terrified. Like I have never been that terrified before a talk. Like I had been giving talks wow. probably at that point for about 10 years and I was really scared. And then right before me was actually the, the right before me was Gabrielle, Gabrielle Yuri, William Yuri's daughter who was doing yeah. the plank. And you know, what was so uh, interesting and vulnerable and brave about her is she has this, uh, I don't know what you call it, like a chronic illness or um, an illness since birth. And so that it was part of the thing that was amazing about her doing such a long plank was also her physical issues. And, and then right after me, and then I was going to go on after her. And then right after me, it was going to be like the San Francisco ballet. <laughs> and I figured what is going on here? Like I, the audience is going to be crying after Gabrielle and then they're going to be anxiously waiting for the ballet. Like they don't, they're not, I had it in my head. The last person they want to see is me after Gabrielle. They just want to get straight to the ballet. It's the end of a long day. You have this totally emotional, beautiful performance by Gabrielle Yuri. And then you have this amazing thing with the San Diego ballet that's going to happen. So I left the conference and I was not going to come back. And this was like, this might have been while you were talking, actually. And I'm like walking around the block and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I can't. I'm just horrified. But I did go back. I was terrified. And I went on the stage. And this often happens with public. People should know who are thinking of being public speakers. This often happens. You're nervous beforehand. But then something, some neurochemical action kicks in. When you actually get on the stage, you something kicks in and you're a new person again. And you, and you do your thing and, and hopefully you do it well. So, so I survived, but I really was, that was probably the moment I've been most terrified to do public speaking. And mm -hmm. I think I did okay. Like right now, if I were to rate it from a zero to 10, I probably did like a five, but uh, it, it was, it was scary. So then afterwards, I, just my mind had, had burnt me out. And I, I don't even know if I watched the ballet. I think I was just 
Done. No, I don't, I don't think so. And then we had this after party, which is really fun because all these, uh, you know, famous classical guitarists and, and thinkers and, and, and me uh, and other people were there. And I remember, yeah, I was the same way. I'd never spoken in front of that many people live. I mean, people have seen a lot of my videos, but, but never that many people live. And uh, my mother-in-law, uh, Allison, was in the audience and she was like, are you nervous? And I said, you know, I like to pull her legs. I said, not, not until just now. How could you ask me such a thing? Now when I think about it, I guess I'm very terrified. Why would you ever say that? She was freaking out because she made me feel like, she thought she made me feel nervous. But I was a little nervous until we got, I mean, we had speaker coaches. And of course, they give you alcohol, which I don't really think about as a positive influence no. on, towards a good. And they also, you went on last. And I think your advice lately, which I, which I really agree with, and I commend you on it as well, is like, if you're going to go on a comment, and I hope we can get to like the physics of comedy later on. But, um, but you talk about, you had this opportunity to get on like before Bill Burr or after Bill Burr. And what, what of course is the, you don't want to be, you know, come on after he's going to, you're going to get slaughtered, but you did that for TEDx. And I wonder if that was your first kind of endeavor, you know, closing out a show, basically closing out a show because the ballet dancers uh, didn't have much to say, uh, you know, to the audience they were performing. Well, you know, I think it was more the kind of status of TEDx that was scaring me even more than the size of the audience. Like, because I've spoken in front of thousands of people before that, but it was where I was like more in control of the situation. It was like an event, maybe set, like, like I used to be a spokesperson for Fidelity. So they would have these huge events with like five to 10,000 people and I would speak. And so I had felt a little more comfortable at those because they were there to see me. Whereas TEDx is like just a long day and everybody's great. Like, look, you're, you should be your Nobel prize winner and you were speaking and then there's me. So you know, and then, and William Urey, Gabrielle Urey, there's so many great speakers that were there. And I think I was just, and then, and then, like you said, we were coached mm -hmm. and it was almost like we're overcoached. Like my, yeah. my coach, I think didn't really like me that much. And mm -hmm. so she was like, no, do this, do this. And like, I had already been doing public speaking for 10 years, but I felt like I had to stay within the rules of her coaching because it's, it is TEDx. Yeah. And I don't know, I, I kind of lost my, my, center of psychological gravity and and again you do kind of get it back at the end there's uh, there's other techniques too there's there's um there's a cognitive bias if you go last mm -hmm. where it's called a choice ambiguity bias so if you say that if the first thing you say is hey everybody give it a, you know i'm the last speaker give it up for everybody who's gone before me so they yeah. all clap but because you've kind of lumped everybody into this category of everybody they actually at that moment it's a cognitive, they have a hard time remembering anything about who they saw before because mm -hmm. they just kind of clap for the group. So in their brain, they had to reorganize their brain to do right. that clapping. What am I not going to clap like, for the girl who's got a congenital disease? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, they probably remember her, but then they, but they probably everyone else becomes the other. Right. And uh, so that's a technique I often use when I'm on last. It usually works. But this time I was just yeah, I was just in in a state of terror, you know, and then and then afterwards it I was, you know, whatever we had 15 minutes, I was just totally burnt out. And, you know, it's funny now looking back at my talk because I watched videos of my talks just to study them. And even mm -hmm. now I'll watch talks from 2013, 2014. I've watched that talk recently and I can see now what I've learned since then. And, and I think I would do things differently now. The, mm -hmm. the key would be, though, would be to overcome the coaching because ultimately now in retrospect i don't think the coaching was was that great but yeah. uh, uh and and not to criticize her she might have been doing what they told her to do but uh, i think i would have played it a little differently if i if i was the coach yeah i want to get your thoughts on the rapid fire you know portion that's uh the the blitz at the end of the conversation about you know is ted over is it are, are we past peak Ted. Uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I mentioned earlier in the introduction that, you know, we kind of had this connection uh, through uh, Jim Simons and, and wanting to uh, communicate some ideas or so, so forth with him. I understand that you not only um, applied for a job at Renaissance, perhaps, uh, you proposed yeah. this question that I'm going to answer for you uh, here, but also you claim that you have a strategy, which, which is, uh, you know, which, which is, uh, possibly a potential interest to them. So I know that, uh, you know, we're just sharing this between a few thousand yeah. close friends. So yeah, uh, yeah. Just, you, <laughs> nobody's solve? here. Nobody's listening. Well, it's not so much a strategy that would be interesting to him, um, but it's reverse engineering. You know, he has many strategies and he has a couple of funds and, and 
there was one time where he was launching a fund that was going to be stocks only, which is unusual for Renaissance. Like they do every asset class, but they do a lot of like inter-country stuff and, and currency and, and, and things like that. But he, at one point, this is like 10 years ago, maybe a little more, or actually it was more, it's like 15 years ago, he was launching a huge, huge mega fund that was going to be stocks only. And at the time, and I think this is still the case, I think I more or less reverse engineered the strategy of that fund. And it's not a complicated strategy. He'll basically invest in every small to mid-sized public company that has a large amount of cash, no debt, and is either profitable or break even. With the idea that if they have a lot, like let's say a company has 500 million cash, no debt, and you know, and they're not even that big. Like let's say they're, they're, their burn before revenues is like 50 million a year. They're going to be in, they're going to be in business for a long time. And so if you combine that concept with the idea that, you know, Warren Buffett has a strategy where he says, if a business is going to be still be in business 20 years from now, it's probably a good investment now. So the best way to ensure a business is going to be in business 20 years from now is to look at their balance sheet. And if they have a lot of cash, if they have no debt, if they, if their exp yearly expenses are nowhere near their cash levels, it's probably going to be in business 20 years from now. So my, my thinking is, and you could, you could see this by looking at, if you do, you could look at it in different, test this idea in different ways. If you look at any company that has a lot of cash and no debt, chances are Renaissance Technologies is one of the larger shareholders, even now. A, a big companies are small, because I remember during the, the, the bottom of the most recent crash that we're potentially still enduring, <clears throat> uh, you know, I looked at, I talked to a friend of mine, you know, uh, do you think it's a good idea to invest in Verizon or uh, for AT&T? And he was like, well, let's compare them. I, I, you know, the street thinks Verizon is a much better bet. And I said, well, just out of curiosity, what is their, or what's their revenue? And it's like $29 billion. Holy cow, that's awesome. That's amazing. And I was like, just out of curiosity, what's their debt? And it's like, $200 billion. Like these companies have multi hundred billion dollar debt that even if they took all the revenue just to pay down their debt in, in, you know, four years, they'd be bankrupt. So yeah. How, how do these companies, so it can't apply to, they can't print money. It can't apply no, to like right. super huge companies. Right. Right. No, I, I don't think, you know, so for that type of company, he probably has other funds and other strategies. It's just specifically this one um, fund I was reverse engineering. And I noticed because I always like, at this time, this was like 14 or 15 years ago, I always like companies that have a large amount of cash and no, no debt. I'm very uh, uh, risk averse. So, uh, you know, and again, it's, it's hard to piece through his filings because his biggest funds own hundreds and hundreds of companies. So it's hard to necessarily find them. But if you look at even small or medium-sized companies, and again, if you do a search on, there's various stock screeners out there. If you do a search on uh, companies that have, Again, large cash, zero debt. So they're usually like mid-sized companies, or maybe they might even be biotech companies. Uh, biotech companies really, you know, research companies don't really take on a lot of debt. He's usually, he's, Renaissance Technologies is usually one of the major shareholders. But, but now he's got, you know, tens of billions of dollars in this fund. So he, he, he has to be in hundreds of stocks. But there are hundreds of small to medium-sized companies that have a lot of cash and no debt. And so I just figured that was the basic strategy. And he figured it's a, it's a strategy. He doesn't have to really focus on too much. It's a very simple, like, just make sure they're not going out of business. Well, no debt. Uh, they have expenses to go for it, or at least, you know, five to 10 years, whatever his uh, thing is. And that's, that was my reverse engineered approach. And I only noticed it not by studying what companies he was invested in, but that I noticed that every company I was interested in using these metrics, he seemed to be invested in. And when I looked at companies that didn't have those metrics, he wasn't invested in. Mm -hmm. So, so that that's, was my sort of reverse engineering there. Now for his main hedge fund, uh, which he's had since the early 90s, or I, I, I think it was like the early 90s uh, when he started, I, that's a much more complicated um, uh, algorithmic like arbitrage between currencies and things like that. Well, that's right. That's the, it, it, so he was implementing idea sex before the idea for idea sex was hatched in your idea. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, I mean, basically for a long time, as I understand, you know, Greg Zuckerman, who I guess is a friend of yours and a friend of mine, yeah. he wrote his autobiography, his biography um, of Jim Simons, which, you know, it's funny because Jim comments on the book. He's like, I don't think it's a very good book in my podcast. <laughs> so that's funny. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to send this to, to Greg, um, uh, who's a good friend. Uh, but 
the uh, but the but the point was, you know, back in the day, pe people would say, oh, "How do they do it?" and and uh, you know, "How do they consistently do it?" It's one thing to do well, and and so I asked him, like, "How do you do it? What's the secret? Give us the secret sauce right now." No, so I, I didn't ask him that, but I said, you know, it's it's interesting because th what Renaissance did for the first time, as he explained it to me, and I parsed it through the all toucher filter of of idea sex. Back then, there was like. Uh, technical analysis, which is like looking at charts. I, I mean, you know much more about hedge funds than yeah. I do, uh, ever, ever know. But there's technical analysis and there's fundamental analysis. So what and, Renaissance- and, 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 there's, and there's quantitative analysis, which is yeah. different than technical analysis. Right, so, so that was the third- Technical analysis, he would not do. I doubt- Correct. Uh, unless, he, unless he misinterpreted and thought you said quantitative analysis. Tech analysis, for people like that, and, and, for, and even for me, like, it's bullshit. Like, that mm -hmm. doesn't really yeah, it's exist like for serious tea investors. leaves and, right. But, but, but applying the, um, the quantitative analysis had never been done to something that has fundamental analysis. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, he would look at, you know, uh, pork bellies or whatever, and he would do that, and he would do a quantitative uh, regression analysis against the Turkish lira, you know, whatever. And, and there'd be some advantage. And in, the, in our discussion, he's like, all we needed was, you know, a 0.001% advantage because we have so much capital that we can exploit that lever. As long as it's 50.0001% probability of, of success, we would put a ton of cash behind it because they had a ton of cash. So it was right. kind of the like card counting and blackjack. Like you yeah. only in, in the best card counters, like let's talk Ed Thorpe, who was the original card yeah. counter and, was and then started affiliated with, fund. right. Who is uh, one of their sub head funds, I think. But, but, but he, he basically, you would just need a, a like you say, a 0.01% advantage. And that's when, you know, to, to start betting huge. Yeah. And so, so yeah, the co combining this kind of fundamental analysis, like if there's a drought in Peru, then, you know, Peruvian wheat is, I, I'm just, I, I have no idea yeah. what the hell I'm talking about, but, the, but that will go down. So that's a fundamental thing. You can just look at that. Now, the one thing that they did have for decades was they actually had like newspaper clippings, you know, going back to whatever the 1930s. And so they could do these regression analyses as far as I understand it uh, for a long time. And, and I think that was one of the, one of the major advantages that they had. And again, you just need this fraction of a percent advantage if you have the cash flow to stay alive. And that's the hard thing, I think. And so because they had the first mover advantage, because they had the idea sex of a quantitative plus fundamental for the first time, really, they really came to monopolize that space and, and have done really well. And so yeah. that is a great book uh, that I, I, I know Jim doesn't. And actually, one of the things we'll talk about at the very end is kind of legacies and books and so forth. Uh, today's well, podcast. But yeah, go well, ahead. You, you know, another, another, I'll just reverse engineer a, a little bit of at least Renaissance's early strategies. I don't know if they still do this, but like, just take the idea of quantitative analysis for a second. And I'll, I'll make it very simple. Let's say, you know, Canada and the United States are essentially the same country financially. Like if the US does well, Canada is going to do well. If Canada does well, the US is going to do well. Yeah. Um, so if, if one, if two days in a row, Canada goes up and the US goes down, then it's almost common sense. Okay. U.S. just went down. They should be going up and down together. But if U.S. goes down two days in a row, Canada goes up. They've diverged. So mm -hmm. now snap them back together. So buy the U.S. and short Canada. So you actually take very little risk because country markets don't really move that much versus stocks. And you have the extra advantage that you've seen. So really quantitative analysis, you've statistically back-tested. Well, the last 500 times, Canada went up two days when the U.S. went down two days. If you buy the U.S. the next day and you short, you sell Canada the next day, they'll snap back together. So you do all sorts of – you find all sorts of pairs like that that are statistically related. Now, people used to do uh, – if they're fundamentally related, like if, if GM goes up and Ford goes down, but you know, th uh, then you snap them together. But, you, but it's much better to do it where it's statistically related because there's interesting things that happen because Canada and the U.S. are also very different. Canada is a natural resources country. The U.S. isn't. So Canada and Canada is a, uh, an ex-British country. U, uh, U.S. is, but not as much as Canada and Australia, which is also a resources company, uh, country. So you can, you can do the same arbitrage with Canada and Australia. So sometimes Australia has a bigger gravitational pull on Canada, and sometimes the U.S. does. And you could statistically model that all out. And that's what I believe Simon started off with on his – uh, quantitative arbitrage strategies. And he would always do arbitrage. So he would take very little risk. Like a strategy like that uh, in 2008, which it was even when things were hugely volatile after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, that was actually a very successful strategy.
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I had on my podcast um, twice already, Eric Weinstein. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, super smart guy. Super smart. And he was, uh, he's a managing director of Teal Capital. I know you're close with Peter Teal and you've had him on the show. Um, and Eric and I were talking and one of the things he says to me is, is you know, I had an idea for an un, unsinkable or undefeatable arbitrage strategy. And when I went to work, he w- was working on Wall Street in a hedge fund before Teal Capital in the, in the late 90s or something like that. And he said, you know, it was like the rite of passage. You know, you show up for work and the first day of the hedge fund, they'd say, you got any killer ideas? And everybody would say, I've got this idea for this three-way arbitrage, you know, triple, triplet uh, of, of, of uh, currencies, you know, that we could make arbitrage bets on and win. And I just started like cackling at him and, you know, saying, oh, that's a rook- such a rookie mistake. It's like hazing uh, for hedge fund uh, geeks. And uh, he was just like, they try to convince him that that trade would only was correct. The math was hundred percent correct, but it would never work because they didn't have the, the resources to go behind it. So uh, unlike Ren, it wasn't Renaissance, but uh, you know, so there is, you know, never under, I always say that, you know, quantity has a quality all of its own. You know, it's not just like, Oh, we want to spend quality time with my kid. Of course. Yeah. But quantity of time is equally important. And, and we'll get into fatherhood because you and I are both fathers of five. Yeah. And, and I, I want to uh, pick your brain about fatherhood as we go. No, on. And you know what though? It's, it's, I, I could go on and on about the hedge fund strategies. Cause that's such a, a fascinating topic. I'm sure Eric uh, had some, you know, in the late nineties in particular, in the early OOs, still people had not, implemented these quant strategies there was maybe renaissance and there was a company called aqr there's very few quant funds out there so there was opportunity and by the way there were also scam opportunities that were that were under regulated Mm -hmm. so so one strategy in the 90s that was brilliant that unfortunately you know it was you know i wasn't even aware of it but people made hundreds of millions of dollars and then it got regulated and those people just disappeared like they're they're gone with their billions or whatever, but you, it, was called, it was a strategy called playing the calendar. So you would open up an account at Goldman Sachs and you would just trade millions of shares of stock, generating lots of fees for the brokers. And the goal was to lose as little money as possible. Mm-hmm. So, you would, so the brokers would end up with these huge fees and you would hopefully not lose so much money. And then when there was a big IPO that happened, like eBay, you know, in the not late 90s, you you would you would say to your broker, hey, you just generated you know several hundred thousand dollars in fees. I want the biggest allocation possible from eBay, and 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 you would get it, and you would sell. It would go up three hundred percent the first day, and you would sell, even mm-hmm. though you're not really supposed to sell the first day. They would try to make you sign something not to sell the first day, but because you were generating so many fees, they would let you get away with it. Mm-hmm. And it's called playing the calendar because you'd open up accounts depending on which bank's doing what IPO on what day. Yeah. And I know that you've, uh, you, you were not only deeply involved in this hedge fund world, but you also uh, were one of the writers on the hit show Billions on, H, on um, Showtime. I, I was a, an advisor, yeah. So an advisor, I, I advised sorry. the writers, yeah. And one of my favorite things, so I'm going to take uh, the Jim Simons episode of Into the Impossible and divide it up into little clips like uh, you've taught us how to do so spectacularly successfully. I'm going to take this, uh, take these clips and, and, and put and one of them is going to be called, you know, Jim Simons on this one weird tip that'll make you billion. No, uh, it's, it's going to be where he goes through and explains, you know, alpha and beta. And that was actually your question. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Uh, but he gets to, you know, this description of what is alpha and he thinks about it mathematically and, and, and geometrically actually, and we'll describe that. And so it's unique. And I, I really felt like little goosebumps, you know, as he's describing it, kind of like Einstein, let me just give you a lecture on, you know, relativity and the speed of light uh, much better than Brian Keating could ever do. But Jane, uh, I, uh, I doubt that because you were, you were explaining it to me. Yeah, on well, the podcast. Yeah, I do my best and we'll talk about pedagogy and academia. Cause I know you've got so many thoughts about that as well, but getting back to Jim, he goes through this, uh, you know, description and, 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 and then I was looking up because I knew you had been an advisor to Billions. So I looked up Billions and, uh, and James Altucher. And it comes up with a, with a blog post uh, from a few years back. And basically in the blog post, y- you basically say that almost every hedge fund is crooked. And, and you have this, this story about, you know, you applied for a job with a certain uh, securities uh, dealer firm and you were rejected. And we deal a lot with rejection, fear of rejection. I wonder if you could tell that story and whether or not you think because you basically accuse most hedge funds of doing something crooked or illicit. And the question is, does that apply, do you think, to, to Renaissance? Uh, but first, why don't you tell your quick story uh, of, about 
your uh, misadventures with applying for a job and getting rejected? It must really sting looking back in retrospect. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I have a bunch of rejection stories. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a Renaissance rejection story. Are we oh, talking okay. about that one? Yeah. No, no, do that one. Uh, do, do that one first. And then there's another one with a guy named Bernie something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. First do, first do Jim. So, so I wrote, you know, I was doing all these quantitative strategies and I was, um, and actually other quant based hedge fund managers were investing with me. So, uh, I wrote to Jim Simons, I figured out his email address. You know, you kind of, uh, look, you Google at Renaissance technologies.com all over the internet and you see how they format their emails. And then I wrote, I figured out how, uh, how to write Jim. So I wrote to him, I described my background, I described my strategies. And he's like, this is great. You should come in and, and talk to us. We'd love, I'd love to meet you. Um, and at this point, I had also written a book about quant strategies. It was my very first book uh, called Trade Like a Hedge Fund. And, and, then he's, and then I forget who brought it up. But he, I think he asked, but wait, uh, do you have a PhD? Uh, he said, I noticed you went to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon. Do you have a PhD? And I said, actually, I got thrown out of Car Carnegie Mellon. So I never got the PhD. And he's like, oh, we oh, it's a rule. We only hire PhDs. So I don't think I that's correct. I actually, I think, I think there might've been other ideas, but what, when was this again, James? That was like 2004. Um, but maybe they still did. But, um, but soon after that, they stopped. Cause I, I had a whole bunch of grad students that wanted to get jobs with him. And he, at the end, he was just like, no, we've got too many PhDs. We got too many eggheads basically. And we need some people to understand business, <laughs> but that's uh, funny. so it could have been a pretext, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And then another time I was raising money for a hedge fund and my neighbor uh, says to me, Hey, I work for this one guy. He's really nice. Why don't you come in? So we go in and uh, his boss gives me a, a tour of the office. Uh, great guy. He explains everything. We go into his office and he says, okay, James, what can I do for you? And I said, well, uh, I was, I have a different strategy, I think than you. And why don't you, I, I was hoping you could invest money with me. And you know, we can figure out the, the details. I'll give you a, a break on fees or give you equity in the fund. He said, listen, I'm sorry. If, if you, if you want to work here, you know, I like you, you're, you're smart. You're friends with Danny, the guy who brought you in. Uh, you could get a job. We will hire you any day you want, but I don't know where you put your money. I don't know where you invest. So the last in many points himself, he says, the last thing we need here at Bernard Madoff securities is to see Bernard Madoff Securities LLC on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So, uh, and then he, he, I was crushed. Like I thought like, oh, he, he rejected me and he's got better returns than me. How am I ever gonna compete in this industry? Like I couldn't raise money. And uh, I actually got out of, I started the process of shutting down my hedge fund after that because of <laughs> Bernie Madoff. <laughs> so you, you, you benefited from his investing advice in and, one way. And you, you know what's funny too is that after he was exposed, he was exposed like three, three or four years later. So yeah. after he was exposed, uh, everyone, all my friends in the business was like, oh, we totally knew he was a scam. And, and I said, no, you know, I remember when I was walking into the building, you were calling me and begging me to ask him to let you put money into his fund. I don't right. think you knew all along. So no, not very few people knew. Yeah, but a hundred percent of people claim they knew. Oh yeah, it's like at Woodstock, there were twenty times more people who thought they were there, claimed they were there. But yeah, looking at him, and then yeah, I mean, look at that's that uh, medallion fund that's run by Renaissance Technologies. I, I think they've been, you know, haven't ever had a down year, you know, in thirty, forty years, whatever it's been. And uh, and no, no one's saying, oh yeah, I, I knew it in a second. You know, he must have been doing something crooked. Um, you know, you know, some people, some people have said to me, or they've asked me, is Renaissance. Uh, doing something uh, not totally kosher, and, but I was always convinced they were completely kosher. A, I knew people who had who had worked there. B, I reverse engineered at least one or two of their strategies. And and C, you know, most most people uh, don't know how to research these things. So I show people, oh, you can see here's the whole here's Jim's you know Renaissance's stock holdings, like they're legit uh, company. Yeah. So you know, it's, it's fine. So, so you asked me <laughs> to ask him a question about, um, about the difficulties in the in environment that they operate in now, uh, brought about largely by their success. Um, are they being victimized essentially by the proliferation of quantitative hedge funds? And, uh, and, and yeah, essentially, are they a victim of, of their own success that they really were the kind of first movers in the space? And now there's so many quants, et cetera. And so I, I did ask him about that. And, and you said, you know, are there problems capturing alpha? 
And it was good that you did because that prompted him to like, well, let me explain alpha and let me explain beta. And, you know, I encourage people to listen to the podcast because he does it in a signature way. So James, uh, Jim was a, was a mathematician before he was a hedge fund pioneer. He was a mathematician. And you worked he, with your dad, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, they worked together at SUNY Stony Brook. He hired my father, the gun that was their connection from SUNY, from Cornell, where my father had been uh, the youngest full professor ever at Cornell to come to SUNY Stony Brook to start this fledgling math department where they worked together. And Jim goes, and so, you know, describing, you know, alpha, he's like, he thinks about it in terms of like, you know, a topographic surface in this higher dimensional space. And he goes through like, well, you have to look at, you know, the properties of these, of these, you know, vector bundles, you know, on top of a, of a surface of a, in an idealized space. And, and that these properties of alpha and beta are orthogonal to each other. And you're looking to maximize, you know, certain properties of this relationship between alpha and beta. And it was funny, James, because it was like, uh, we had the podcast, I think uh, I recorded two weeks ago, uh, the 5th of June. And the market was way up, like way up that day. It was like up 1800 points or something. And he kept just like looking over and looking and he's like, oh God. And he's like, I'm like, Jim, what's wrong? He's like, well, you know, we're getting crushed today. And he even says it in the podcast. And I'm like, you know, Jim, if you need a bridge loan, I'm good, but I'm going to charge you, you know, four and 40, like you guys do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he, he didn't well, appreciate well, that. But, but, but that's an interesting observation on your part that he was looking over at that and he yeah. was stressed because- the, the, the relationship between alpha, beta, and the market is very important and, and suggests how correlated he is with the underlying market. He's not correlated at all to the underlying market. So a big up day, depending on how his bets you know, relate to alpha, beta, gamma, and, every, and vega, it could, you know, he could be very, he could have a huge down day that day. Oh yeah. And it's, and it's, and just as he can make a tremendous amount, you know, leveraged against a tiny amount, um, you know, of, of, of probability above 50, 50 chance, uh, he also can lose a tremendous. So on that day, the market's up 6%, the, the journal, Greg Zuckerman actually reported that the fund that he's in now. So I think he's out of, I don't know if he's out of the middle. I don't know, understand how it works, but, uh, but there are other funds that are open to institutions and he was invested in those and he's probably their biggest investor. And so when those, and Greg reported that those funds are down like 20% on the year, which is like seriously underperforming uh, the S and P even. And of course, nobody would, expect that given the apocalypse which we have gone through maybe haven't gone through i want to get your opinions on that but yes exactly so looking at that it's possible to like understand both how much he views things in terms of bets and you've had annie duke on i know i'm hoping to have her on my podcast someday too oh, she's, and, and, she's got a new book coming out soon too so she'll be yeah she'll be doing the rounds of podcasts yeah one of the things you gave me an idea to do which is like all these authors especially the first time authors but but even second time authors like annie um you know their book tours are all canceled so i was like uh, this is my chance to get you know people on the show who would yeah, you know, never come on the show anyway. So I just pitched. I'll, I'll do an intro email if you want, or maybe you've already talked. No, to her I haven't. I, I've talked to her publicist, but you know, but I would love an intro uh, to her. Um, and I have some great ideas for people that I think you'll resonate with too, uh, including Eric and, and other people. But we'll, uh, we'll we can cover that offline. But he thinks about it so much in terms of hedge, like if you go through, I'm going to have a video up on our channel for the Simons Observatory, which is this hundred million dollar project in the high Atacama Desert, 17,000 feet above sea level in Chile, that we're looking for the, uh, the, the signatures of the Big Bang. Here's a little note card, thank you note, oh my God. Uh, with our website on it. So it's got, and we have an animated, it's really cool. Anyway, he's, when we talk about it, he's like, well, and I just talked to him last Friday again to give a little inspirational um, and, uh, uh, marching orders to the, to the collaboration as we endure COVID ourselves and, and get through our, 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 our daily work. And he said, you know, like, uh, you're going to be on this guy soon. We're going to have information about the about the origin of the universe very soon, or we may find out that it's uh, that that it didn't have a big bang. There wasn't a sing and that's what I prefer. But I don't care because even if I'm wrong, if I'm right, the universe didn't have a big bang. There was just an infinite cycle of creation and destruction events, uh, creative destruction, like the hedge fund uh, titan he is. But but if it, if it did have an origin and you detect it, then we win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so he's like, I'm like, you even hedge that. Like you you hedge your science bets too. It's but that's it's funny. it's clear to me that that's the way that he analyzes everything and it's pure but even drilling down deeper it comes from a basis of geometry and the properties of the way that he sees things i asked him in the podcast i was like you know oftentimes said that a certain thing in math will be beautiful like the nobel prize winner paul dirac said it's more important that your equations are beautiful than that they agree with experiment 
I don't agree with that, but but people fall in love with this beautiful aspects of mathematics. But he, tr- I said, well, what is beautiful to you in mathematics? And you can listen to the podcast when it comes out. But but basically, you know, things that have a symmetry or a beautiful unity or express some some essence of of the un- an underlying truth. Those are things that can then, in all teacher speak make make connections or network or, or idea sex that can combine to leverage up as hedge funds do to make a greater gain than you would have expected like there, there he, he admits he's like i can't do math anymore uh i haven't been able to do math for 10 years but i can still think you know in terms of a, of a of hedge funds i can still think in terms of bets i can still think in terms of philanthropy but he's using these meta skills that he that he derived and and developed uh much younger in life as a mathematician i also asked him you know um do you think mathematicians always do their best work by age 30. And, and it was kind of interesting to hear is because he's in, you know, he's 82 years old. He smokes six packs of Merit cigarettes a day for the last six decades, uh, which made it really fun to take him up to 17,000 feet on oxygen, pure oxygen tank. But he survived. I took him up but, there last year. By the way, on that question, you know, I've read something recently. Gosh, I forget where I read it. But I read a, a, a book about that very question and they pointed or a chapter on that question. And they pointed out how Einstein Actually, his most cited work was when he was in, I believe, in his 40s. Yeah. So it was some, it was some, some of, of his, it. It was some of his analysis on quantum mechanics like in right. the 20s. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did. So, I mean, 1905, he was 25 years old. So, you know, that's the miracle year. But, you know, 10 years later, he was 35 and doing much more technical mathematics. I mean, the special theory of relativity, the constancy of the speed of light, length contraction, time dilation, those are those are mathematic, but the, the equations are algebra, basically, um, a little geometry, uh, you know, Pythagorean theorem with an, uh, what's called a hyperbolic uh, geometry. But, um, but for general relativity, I mean, he had to basically invent new mathematics or apply things from like the 1800s and what's called differential geometry, the same kind of math that Jim Simons traffics in. And uh, so I think that was really interesting. He did say that it is harder to, to, you know, just to answer your question, you know, give you a preview of the episode, that it is harder now because of, you know, firms like Renaissance and others to really capture alpha while preserving beta, you know, or minimizing beta volatility. And, uh, but, you know, it's kind of like, we were reminded of uh, supercomputers. So the Moore's law is, you know, is this exponential growth, is this, you know, increasing exponential, as our mutual friend uh, Peter Diamandis loves to talk about. And that's one of the uh, properties of technology when it becomes demonetized and democratized. But one of the Ds, that actually the D in democratization means that the utility function is higher. So the reason that the total amount of compute computations isn't really increasing worldwide, even though the speed of each individual computer and the speed of the fastest computer uh, on earth is not uh, benefiting to the extent that you'd predict based on Moore's law. It's because there's a util- there's a usage penalty. Like the more powerful the computer gets, the more people want to use it. And, and so it gets a subscription tax hmm. and it hmm. can't, cause there's an overhead associated with each process or job as they call it. And, and then the processing within each process also has a tax and overhead. So, um, so, even though the, the fundamental unit of computation is getting better and better, it's getting, it's also a victim of its own success. So we related it to that. And so there's more of them. And so it's harder and harder to find opportunities. Uh, but, and it's harder to maximize what mathematicians call the surprise. Like, you know, it's not a surprise if I say, you know, Florida's pretty hot and humid right now, Jane, like that doesn't tell you. So you're not surprised to hear that. Um, and so the, I've revealed, I've communicated information, but it doesn't have any utility. So in this case with computers, they're getting faster and faster or with, or with hedge funds, there's more and more of them. But, uh, but the underlying revelation of new information is, is constant or maybe it's declining. So in some ways for their flagship funds, I don't think that they've really suffered at all because of this. Whereas the institutional funds, according to Greg Zuckerman, they, they have because they're, they're competing. You know, he said in the, in the medallion fund, they can do 90%. They could be as much as 90% short, I think. Uh, at a given time. And, uh, but in the, uh, you know, for every dollar, uh, they could also, they could go at 90, 90 cents short or something like that. Uh, whereas for the institutional fund, he, I think he said, told me that it's like 5%. So you don't have, it's asymmetric wagering. Like you can't really exploit a surprise function benefit to your advantage. Yeah. And he, you know, it's, it's tricky though. I, I'm still intrigued where he finds I mean, he, he's not going to really give the real answer because that's how he makes billions of dollars. So, but um, I'm intrigued. I'm curious what his process now is for finding alpha because 
it's very, it's very difficult. Like every, there's kind of been a race to the bottom on every strategy. So like for, take, take as an example, this Canada US arbitrage strategy I described before. Well, if everybody knew that strategy and this is not such a complicated strategy, then, you know, right as soon as the, the divergence happens, everybody jumps in and snaps it back together. There's no more arbitrage. Right. So, you know, I remember one time I had a strategy that was literally, it was like an ATM machine. The strategy works so well. <laughs> so, and it was basically if, if the NASDAQ was gapping up in the morning between 0.4 and 0.6%, I could short it at 9.30 AM. And within a half hour, it was going to go back to even at some point, And I would, I, I was done for the day. And so I wrote about this on an article on a financial website and somebody called me up who was working on the strategy with me and other strategies. And he said, what did you just do? Why, Why did, did you, you just, and I'm like, nah, no one's going to play it. And the, the market's <laughs> huge. Like you think just a few readers are going to squash this out. Strategy never worked again. <laughs> it, it worked. It literally had worked 99 times out of the prior hundred times. And oh. then it never worked again. They talk about, Jim talks about in, I think in um, Greg's book, how there are certain signals, you know, they describe everything in terms of signals, uh, which is, you know, some uh, correlation analysis must be used for that. And uh, he says he's got some signals that like haven't ever not worked. Now, that, you know, for the medallion fund, as I understand it, uh, you know, so there's signals that go back 30, 40, 50 years. You just got to wonder what the hell is like still correlated, you know, that is it contains the surprise entropy, you know, that's like a discovery that only they know. And of course they're not going to say what it is. Uh, so I, I thought it was really interesting, but really to see how he does things. And I also talked a lot about him uh, about academia and leadership and, and kind of got his, his notion of what, um, uh, of, of, you know, kind of what his role model is for a leader. And I wonder, have you had on Doris Kearns Goodwin? I forgot. No, you know, and I've considered having her on, and for some reason, I didn't. I don't know. I forget why. So I thought of a way that you could get her on, which is that I'll send you the link to, obviously, the, to the video, Jim. But I asked him, what, uh, who's your favorite historical figure of all time? And he said, without a hesitation, Lincoln. I was like, well, you know, why, why not Euclid? Or, you know, his boat is named after Archimedes' his famous quote, uh, you know, Eureka. His boat is called Eureka because, you know, that's what uh, Archimedes said when he got into the tub, uh, allegedly. Uh, it floats. <clears throat> but, um, but then I asked him because I was like, I got to get Doris Kearns Goodwin on the show. So I was like, any good books you can recommend? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, Doris Kearns Goodwin. So what I'll do is I'll send you because you can get I can't get access to her, but I'll, I'll send you the link and just say like the world's most brilliant billionaire uh, is uh, obsessed with your work or whatever. We'd love to have you in you know, conversation. Can yeah, we talk about it. So I'll send yeah, you that's that. a great idea. Lincoln, yeah. or what was it? Um, her book about Lincoln. Yeah, um, team of rivals. Yeah, right. So it specifically refers to his leadership strategy, which exactly. is to have kind of this discourse which is something that which never happens in American politics since, <laughs> which is to have discourse among people who disagree with each other because exactly. he needed that kind of consensus to 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 lead in such a difficult time. And I said to him, look, you know what, what you were also before you were leading these hedge funds and so forth, you were the, the chairman of the inaugural chairman of the SUNY Stony Brook math department. And what was your strategy there? Because I had asked him, you know, when we were on the trip to Chile last year, you know, about this kind of what's his leadership strategy. And he also mentioned a book. And I can't find the name this book, but it's, um, it's a fictional book. It's called like Captain or the Captain. It must have come out in the 60s or whatever. And it's about a naval captain, a fictional story about this naval captain who is like exemplary, you know, in terms of leadership and building consensus. But then Jim's strategy in some sense was to let people you know, passionately decide the things they're passionate about. You know, it's like he would let them kind of burn out their energy and they'd have squabble. We want to hire this person in, in uh, integral analysis, you know, whatever uh, at the math department. But then there's something that was really important to him. Then he would speak up. And because he didn't, you know, waste all of his political capital, so to speak on the decisions that he really didn't care about. I mean, you could hire somebody good and another, he didn't really care. But when it came to something or some decision or some new program or course or whatever that he really cared about, then he would lay down his marker and he had a lot more chips really stashed up and he's you know in some sense he learned that from this book captain which i, I gotta find um and uh so maybe we can get a researcher listening out there to do that but um but yeah i thought it was really interesting that he's had success in three different fields that's so rare i mean most people are lucky to have half a career and wait especially three fields there's hedge funds there's the math and philanthropy 
Oh, okay. And according yeah. to Greg, he's also, he was a code breaker, but, you know, he famously got fired for opposing Nixon's, you know, Secretary of War or whatever in the 70s from this Institute for Defense Analysis. He really didn't last very long as a code breaker, but he was, you know, he, officially that was his, one of his early careers. Um, but I really think of him as this, you know, unique individual for being, you know, achieving the highest level of success, winning the highest prize. You know, there is no Nobel Prize in mathematics, and, and he won this prize that's second, you know, only to, to something like that, or the Fields Medal, called the Veblen Prize when he was young. And then he, uh, and then obviously he went on to start the, uh, the uh, Renaissance Technologies, and also to, uh, to begin the Simons Foundation, which has this unique mission in an academic research or fundamental research, which is only to research things. You know, it's often said that the problem with basic science is that it produces technology. <laughs> like, like if it didn't, you wouldn't expect, like, where's this fast, like, what is studying the Big Bang gonna teach you about, uh, about you know, getting a faster cell phone? Nothing. Uh, but if you look back, the same laboratory that where the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background was discovered, was Bell Laboratories. And it's not an accident because these scientists were uh, serendipitously came upon the signal. They were trying to get rid of this noise uh, in the first communication satellite. So that was like, again, it's kind of like idea sex. You've got, you know, this basic, you know, problem where you want to reduce noise. You're looking at things that are floating around in space. And then accidentally, you never know. And that's the problem. Serendipity is by definition a surprise and it's unexpected. And they are they flip things around and say, we're going to fund things that have high likelihood of success, but are also potential sources to unlock serendipity. And I thought, you know, right now we could get into talking a little bit about academia because, you know, you, you, you talk a lot about uh, your academic you know, pedigree and, uh, and you're famous well, lack for, of. and lack thereof. And, and uh, that cost you a job, probably both at, at Bernie Madoff securities and at the uh, Renaissance, but, right. uh, but I, I think you'll, you know, you, you, you've done okay for yourself. Um, but the, uh, but academia, you know, it's kind of this interesting thing where it, it clashes to be, you know, with, with all due respect, it clashes with a lot of the advice that you give and, and, and potentially has these challenges, especially what I do in the terms of experimental physics. So I want to segue into that. First, I want to preface this, but you know, if Gavin Newsom, my ultimate boss is listening, you know, I love my job. I would do it. You know, I'm going to keep doing, it. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, but, um, you know, you talk a lot about this, this, the, the essence of experiments and, uh, and why the 10,000 hour rule isn't really so ap applicable anymore. You talk about the 10,000 experiments rule. Um, I, I like to say that it's not 10,000 hours for me, it was 13 billion years. So, you know, it's, right. that's, I had to work that long now. So, but in no, but this is why we had, we had the conversation on my podcast where yeah. I was asking you, do you really need the math to be a good physicist? Because what if someone had the ideas like, like conceptually, I could, you could imagine we could do thought experiments about 10 different ways the universe could have started. And then, you know, the math could sort of take care of itself with a mathematician and then focus on the experimental right. stuff without knowing any math. I thought more about that. And I was thinking like, let's say you look at this, this glass apple that my wife got me for my birthday. Um, or, or my, maybe it was my in-laws. Was that like your dream gift? Like she got, Oh you? yeah. <laughs> it's solid diamond. This is amazing. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was thinking like, well, let's say you like Isaac Asimov. I know. Um, let's, let's say, you know, you, you, um, you're looking at the earth and Asimov said something like to the effect that if you think that the earth is a sphere, you're wrong. Um, but you're less wrong than if you think the earth is flat. Like the job of science is to really not to necessarily come up with like something extremely brand new. And, and some people say like Lee Smolin, who's a, a brilliant um, professor friend of mine at the Perimeter Institute, which is a really interesting kind of like very unusual think tank, uh, started from funds from BlackBerry Incorporated, RIM, and that's why it's called Perimeter. But anyway, um, Lee Smolin doesn't even think the scientific method exists or in, in some sense. But, but getting back to Asimov, so, like, would you know enough, like, just as a lay person to say, well, like, the Earth isn't a sphere. Like, I bet you thought the Earth probably is a sphere, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of Well, beautiful. you know, this is a great question because if, if let's say we uh, were transported 3,000 years in the past, okay, it looks to me like the Earth is flat. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah. I would have a I hard time. I tell my time. students, James, I tell my students, can you prove to me, you now have your PhD, like, on the day of their, I'm a, such a a, you know, a piece of, you know what, but, but anyway, I say to them, like, you're now a, a card carrying PhD in astrophysics. I believe that the earth is the center of the universe. Prove me wrong. And 
very few, I mean, I have some brilliant, brilliant students and it doesn't matter. UCSD, it could be Princeton. Hard. It's very hard to do. Sure. But the reason it's hard to do is because people are ignorant in some sense of history and they don't understand how do we come to know what we know, but they certainly have these lacunae, these gaps in their knowledge. And I think, yeah, it looks like it, but the looks can be deceiving. That's why you don't trust your eyes. You build tools and telescopes to augment your eyes, but go on. Yeah. Yeah. But like even, ta- you know, you were, you mentioned Eric Weinstein earlier, who's, you know, got his training in, in physics and math and so on. And, you know, it's, it's hard for people to start with first principles because we don't know, we kind of, like you say, we forgot what they, what they are. We kind of start <laughs> with, we already know about gravity and we already know about Galileo and that's kind of just baked into like just ch- the intro or the forward of our physics books. Like if I, I, you know, you ever read a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Samuel Clemens? By uh, Mark Twain. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so I always wonder if I had to go in time to King Arthur's Court, I'm going to just die because there's nothing I can do. I don't even, I wouldn't even be able to teach them how to boil an egg or like, or make toast or, yeah. and that guy strung together like phone networks and he made guns for them. Like I wouldn't have been able to <laughs> do any of that. There's a book. Um, it's like one of these prepper books or whatever, but it, it's basically, it has that as a thesis. Like, yeah. How to invent how, everything. Yeah. How to invent everything. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think that's really funny, but yeah, getting into science, like can a lay person do this? We talked about it on the podcast. You, it's like, you don't even know enough. And that's not an insult. It's just like, that's not your skill stack. Right. I mean, right. You, you need to know so much about like, well, why is the earth not a perfect sphere? And, and that connects to celestial mechanics and the rotation and also the plate tectonic. Like there's so many meta things that go into it. Um, nobody would, would say like, in other words, it appears that the illusion is so strong. Once you overcome the illusion that the earth is flat, the, uh, the attraction to this beautiful idea of perfect symmetry is very strong. And so it's very resilient to, to disruption, to changes in the way that we think about things. So I do think it's hard to, to really break out of that paradigm, but, but what I want to talk about, you know, next with you is, is, um, you know, as I said, I'm not going anywhere, Gavin, you know, don't worry. But, um, and actually I was thinking, you know, like, you know what the proof that being a professor is the best job that there is, James? Uh, you, can, you, can, you basically can live in a science fiction world and you, you have job security for life from it. Yeah, that, that's one thing. But you know what the proof text, as we would say, you know, Talmudically is, uh, you know what, uh, the most famous human being who ever lived, in, in, uh, you know, born at least after the last couple, in the last couple hundred years, do you know what he did, Neil Armstrong, after he la- came back from landing on the moon? He became yeah. a professor at the University of Cincinnati. <laughs> so, oh, so really? like, yeah, he became an engineering professor at the University of Cincinnati. And he lasted at that job. It was like a year or two after he had walked on the surface of the moon and reached heights that no human being had ever reached. Uh, he did that. He taught. He didn't get tenure. He got, no, I'm just kidding. I, I think he did. He, get he had a PhD too, didn't he? I don't know if he did. Neil, um, Buzz Aldrin does uh, from MIT in aerospace engineering. I don't think he did. No, he was the test pilot. Um, I'm sure that's something Wikipedia can tell me while you answer the next question. The next question is about academia being like kind of the, the um, bizarro world of choosing yourself in that, you know, we talked about this a little bit on, on your podcast, but I want to explore it a little bit more deeply now that we have a little more time. You know, first step, you're in high school. You got to get into college. There's a gatekeeper there. Uh, once you get into college, you have to do well. You have to take the GREs, get into graduate school. These are all the steps to become a professor that I went through. Uh, grad school, you have to do well, have a good thesis, have a good advisor. He or she has to be connected, help you land a next job. Um, and then you have to uh, do well in that job. That's called a postdoctoral scholarship right. or fellowship. Uh, that's kind of this purgatory between uh, being a graduate student and being a professor when you have to show your mettle uh, and show your worth and creativity as an independent scholar. That's when I got fired from Stanford uh, when I was a postdoc, as I talk about. Were you, my were you really depressed then? Um, you mentioned I, I was in your book. Liberated. No, I felt liberated. Like you know, now I'm free. I can do, you know, it, it, it ended up being, you know, I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't be married. I wouldn't, you know, who knows? Uh, maybe I would, yeah. but, but, uh, but the, looking back at life, uh, it, it couldn't have happened any other way. At first, obviously it was devastating. Like Stanford university. It's one of the best places in the world to be. It has this prestige ranking off the charts and to get fired 
but, uh, but I was unhappy there. It was like 1999 in Silicon Valley, making $32,000 a year as a postdoc, living six miles away on the Caltrain's line, where the trains were running back then every 15 minutes from you know five in the morning till midnight. And so I didn't sleep more than five hours the whole year I was there before I got fired. But getting back to postdocs, so you're postdoc, you do well, you're competing against your postdoctoral advisor at some level because you know he or she has to get funding and get tenure him or herself. Then you gotta have to get a faculty job. There's 400 applicate. We had a job opening this year, 400 applications for one position. Uh, you have to get through that gate. Uh, then you have to get uh, funding because you only get a certain amount of, uh, of startup fuel, uh, you know, funding from the university that's going down because budgets are going down. Um, then you have to, you know, apply to the National Science Foundation, get a grant. That's about 15% if you're lucky. Um, and that you have to get past all these gatekeepers and possible trolls and people that are your competitors that are reviewing your pool. Then you get through, then you have to get tenure. So you have a permanent, then you could do, you know, ultimate freedom, but now you're, you, you've invested about 20 years in higher education. You well, know, it's not just that too. You're, you're always ranked according to how many citations are. Exactly. Yeah. So that was the, that was the next thing I want to talk about. There's something called the H index. We'll get into these meta rankings of, of how you assess quality of academia and what your note, like how you would, uh, an alternative to it in the rapid fire section, we'll get to that. Um, and then you can't choose yourself. That was the one rule they gave me at the Nobel Prize that they still adhere to. Uh, they forgot about every other rule or ignore every rule that Alfred Nobel had. And that's that you can't choose yourself. Literally, you cannot choose yourself to win the Nobel. So these are all the gates. These are all the hurdles. That right, but, 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 but they are, but let me ask you this. And this is an important question. They are the gates to what? Yeah, so, so to, you know, for any metric of success, I think, um, not getting tenure is almost like, I, I don't want to say something horrible, but, but it's, it's like losing something like losing a pet, <laughs> you know, it's, it's devastating. And, and it's, it's a huge investment. Like you put in a lot of uh, a tremendous, you've moved, you've had your family, you've done like, and so that's a very important marker. Yes. You know, there's many ways and outcomes after graduate school, but if you want to take the path that I've been, you know, I, I view that I've lived this hunger games basically. And, and I just happen to be lucky. I don't attribute it to my own brilliance, but you know, uh, I have certain skills I know, but, uh, but they're the meta skill. They're not really the skills of like, I'm super brilliant in solving this differential equation in a matrix algebra. It breaks. Yeah. Those aren't my, my core strengths. And so what I wonder is like, yeah, so the metric of, of success is this, you know, at least that, that getting, yeah, you don't have to win the Nobel Prize, but if you don't get tenure, uh, that's pretty devastating. And, and right. actually you don't get, find out until you, if you got tenure until you're in your late thirties, maybe early forties, think about starting your life all over again. Yeah. It sounds romantic, but you've had 20 years in higher education, 22 years of higher education. It's hard not to feel like you're a failure at that. Point. Sure. Sure. You're, you're because because like very specifically answer the question, this is the path or the gateway to what? Well, I, th I think, you know, what people want to do, if you want to be a scientist, it's very difficult. In the 1800s, you could get, you know, do a small experiment and find uh, electricity emanating from a spark gap or whatever. You or can't James do that. Watt well, could make the steam engine. He was just uh, like a mechanic. Yeah, right. Or the Wright brothers could invent an airplane and their bicycle. Right, they owned a bicycle shop. <laughs> right. So, so the, the low-hanging fruit has been plucked. And I guess the question is, if you're addicted to science, if you love science, and you're good, you're just good, but like there's some person who's on your tenure committee who's going to choose you and you'll never know who she, he or she was. Uh, but but, I, gonna, but I'm still going to dispute the the answer to the question. It's not really to be a scientist. It's to be a tenured professor in a science department at a college. Because then to be a scientist, you still have to raise money. You still have to manage a team, pick the team, you know, publish more to get you know uh, you know people attracted to working with you. So so it's specifically what you described was a gateway to being a an associate professor at. A, a, a university and yeah. but there are but 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 and and so the argument is that's the only path even though you gave me an example of neil armstrong obviously didn't take that path but he became a tenured professor at a university so but let's say he's an, let's say he's an outlier there's outliers in other industries like michael dukakis is a tenured professor at harvard because he went ran for president he doesn't have a phd but he ran for president so, that qualifies. so we could we could come up with outlier anecdotes of people who did not take the path you rigidly described yeah. to get to be associate professor. There's, but let's just assume they're outliers. Yeah. But there's also the fact that you have like take Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's mm -hmm. 
you know, a very smart <laughs> yeah. astronomer, cosmologist. World's most you know. famous scientist in human history. Yes. <laughs> right. But if he did not have a PhD, he could still do what he does. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, his, I would yeah. argue he is, I don't know, since I don't know the science part, I would argue he has just as much communication skills or more. He's a, he's a media, per, he's a charismatic oh, media yeah. personality. And he's the head of the Hayden Planetarium. Right. Yeah. yeah so, sure. so, so, and then, and you know, uh, then there's also guys like uh, Dan Carlin has one of the most popular podcasts on the planet called Hardcore History. Mm -hmm. And when he st when he started that podcast, mm -hmm. it, it started because he and he lives in Montana. He was always arguing at the dinner table uh, about history, and he was like really into all these like esoteric ancient wars that nobody's ever heard of. And his I think his mother said you should just start a podcast. And he's like I can't do that. I'm not. I don't have a PhD in history, but he did it. He chose himself without the PhD and he has like the most popular history podcast right. on the planet. The fact that a you, great living. Yeah. The fact that you can name these few people speaks to the survivorship bias. I mean, there's many more people. Let's say you wanted to teach at a universe at a college level. Let's just forget about university where there's even more hurdles to getting grants and getting papers or, you know, yeah. a teaching college, you know, a, a, some, a school where they don't give out PhDs necessarily. Um, you know, it's terminal degree to get a, a bachelor's degree. Uh, that's might be all you ever wanted to do and you wanted to teach and yeah, you could, maybe you could get a job and, and, and teach, teach high school. I'm not denigrating that at all. I mean, my greatest inspirations are now we're high school teachers, but if that is your goal, if you see your, your a core identity of who you are as a teacher, as a giver, as someone who loves, and I was having this conversation earlier, you know, um, there's one book in the whole federal registry of documents. You know, this covers the IRS, the FCC, the SEC, like all the different federal three letter agencies, there's one book where you'll find in order to succeed in this particular field, you'll find Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you'll find the words like your students need to feel loved. And, and I'm just curious, like, do you think that's the IRS? Like, wh where do you feel, wh where do you think like the word love and, and, and CIA, need? what's that? CIA, definitely. Uh, because, you're because you're recruiting uh, foreign agents and they need, you know, nobody in general, nobody cares that, that the U S gets information, but they want their self-worth to be higher. So yeah. you CIA tells them and says, you're going to be a general in the CIA if you give me information and they love it. Well, that, that may be true, but um, I, and I'm, I'm sure you're right. But, but where I found it is in my side pursuit, my side hustle uh, is uh, wanting to someday be a flight instructor. And to be a flight instructor, you have to pass several different gates, including being a private pilot, a commercial pilot. But then you have to understand the, the, the theory of pedagogy, which I was never taught as a professor. Like no one ever taught me like your students need to feel safe. They need to be fed. They need to have like their physical, physiological needs met. Like I never knew that. And I, I thought, well, why is it for the FAA? You know, like IRS doesn't have this, like to be a kind of general, you know, tax auditor, you know, you really need, no, they don't care. They just go off and, and ream you. Right. Uh, but, but the, but the problem is, you know, for the, the cost of a mistake in learning process for a student of aviation is death. And, and possibly killing other people. So it, it's no surprise in some sense that you'll find it there. Whereas, you know, we kind of say in academia, like, oh, if my student doesn't get in, like I once thought, and this is a crazy, stupid idea, but I was like, how do I know that I made a difference in a student? Like, what's my metric? for success. When I was teaching as a graduate student, I had a NASA fellowship to go out to like kindergartens and teach them about space and NASA. And I was like, how the heck do I know if I'm going to have an influence on this person? If I teach them that there's only eight planets as there are now in the solar system and, and somebody comes back when they're 25 and says, how many planets are there? You know, they could have learned that from anybody. But if I teach them, there's only four planets, <laughs> you know, like, and then at age 25, someone, how many planets are there? Four planets. Then on O'Brien Keating, I had a great, uh, I never did that, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Uh, but like, it's very hard to, to be a good educator and yet we don't really teach it. And so someone who by definition wants to teach at a teaching college or you know, college that's pregnant and they don't get to it, it's, I don't wanna say catastrophic, it is devastating. And so, yeah. so how, but, but what advice very, can you give? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very, very specific goal, right? Yeah. So right. it's someone who is a professor slash teacher um, doing, scientific research and, and at a good school. Then you need all the things that, that you described and you need, you need a few more. Um, you know, you need, like you said, you need to raise grant money and so on. So, so that's a very specific thing. So if I wanted to be a brain surgeon, yes, I, need, I can't be a brain surgeon without a medical degree by, by the law. If I wanted to give medical advice though, 
I don't have to get a medical degree. <laughs> like I, I, maybe I could read a ton of books about brain surgery and even give just as good or even better advice as than a brain surgeon. I just wouldn't be able to legally do brain surgery mm-hmm. or, you know, uh, I've given, because I have experience in a couple of different areas, I've given lectures at law firms and I've been a consultant for law firms, not because I'm a lawyer. I don't, I've never taken a law class in my life, but some areas of the law I know as well as any other lawyer. And in fact, I'm able to give lectures on it. So, or, you know, the same thing goes for, you know, it, it depends on the field, but, and it depends on the type of regulations with the licensing and, and, you know, to be a tenured professor, scientist, teacher is almost as, as hardcore as it's almost like it's regulated like any other licensing is. There, but, there is, yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you wanted to take the skills of a physicist, there's many things you could do. You could work at a hedge fund, you could work at SpaceX, you could work at Google. You know, there's, you could even be doing physics at Google or, or, or a hedge fund or, or SpaceX. Like, let's say a hedge fund is thinking about, you know, high, high speed frequency, you know, high frequency trading. They're, they're dealing at the quantum level and you might need some physics to get an edge for a hedge fund at that level. So, you know, there, there's, you're thinking of a very specific thing yeah. where yes, you, it's, but even then we found exceptions, you know, Neil Armstrong, Michael Dukakis, there's, there might, there's probably more exceptions. And if you go down the chain on the quality of the, the, the school, you're, we're going to find more and more exceptions. Yeah. Like I can't teach physics, but maybe I could teach some other class without any higher education degree at a community college. So, you know, if we lower the quality of the school, it opens up the, 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 the outliers. Yeah. So I think to say, yes, I can't choose myself to be a medical brain surgeon at the, uh, the Cleveland Clinic, but I can, um, if I'm obsessed with medicine and I read all the books and I study things and I read all the latest journals, I might know even more than... You know, they always say a doctor has the most amount of knowledge the day they graduate medical school. But if I'm obsessed with medicine, maybe I might know more than a doctor, even if I haven't practiced it in a a surgical setting. And then- I don't have a degree or practice. (laughs) Right, right, because I'm not legally allowed. But maybe if if a family member has a problem and they call me, I mean, I'm not saying me specifically, but you know, let's say I'm this type of person. Family member calls me and their doctor says this. I could say, ah, that doesn't sound right to me get a second opinion. I Mm -hmm. had that happen recently. Some accountant Mm -hmm. gave me advice and I was like, that doesn't sound right to me. And I would ask them questions and their answers didn't sound right to me. So I got a second opinion and I was right. So, (laughs) so again, like you could learn, you could be the best physicist on the planet without getting, without going through that path. It's just that you have a very specific physical outcome that in 98% of the cases, not even 99, but 98% of the cases require the path. But if you were going to, if you wanted to be, just learn all this physics, you could do a podcast, you could write popular science books, you could work for a hedge fund, you could work for a tech company like Google or a semiconductor company. There's many, you could work for the CIA and build uh, uh, ways to track people's cell phone, GPS. You could work for the IRS actually. You know how the IRS determines if you're living in California versus Texas? Because let's say, you say you're living in Texas because you want to avoid the state taxes of California. Right. It used to be the or IRS. Florida, or Florida, right? Or Florida, right. <laughs> it used to be the IRS would say, let me see your utility bills. Right. Now what the IRS does is they subpoena your cell phone records right. and using physics, they make sure the towers uh, all line up so that 185 days a year you were in, you were accessing towers in, in Florida. You know, right. they, they triangulate your phone and all this stuff. So, there's, you could be a great physicist without doing exactly what you're doing right now. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. how I would choose to view my, I would view the truth. So if I want, like, let's say I'm, I'm 52 years old. If I wanted to be a physicist. Right, right. And so I would basically read all the books, study all the math, read, you know, and I've read, you know, all the popular books, like the Michio Keiko books, Brian Greene, Stephen mm-hmm. Hawking, Neil deGrasse. I've I read all of those books. Brian Keating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At I, least, Brian at least the Keating. first chapter and the last chapter. That, no, no, no. I know I read, for sure. I read the whole book word for word, and uh, but and then I'd have to like study. The next step would be like Feynman's courses on, mm-hmm. on physics. Then I would take some online courses, and then I'd get into more textbook stuff. But I could do it. I just can't do what you do. But then maybe I start a physics podcast, or maybe I write to you and say, "Oh, here's some ideas I have for your experiment," and you hire me to work on the experiment. So I'm not working for the university. I'm working for your grant, mm-hmm. but 
I'm a physicist now doing physics research and you trust it because I would be giving you all the equations and, and you would say, oh, do you have your PhD? And I would say, nah, and you'd say, okay, I can't hire you at UCSD, but I'll hire you on my grant funds and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So I could still be a physicist. I could choose myself to be a physicist even now. Yeah, and be physics adjacent, right? Um, I, 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 and I can I, even teach. I could do an online course at Coursera on physics. If I write a popular physics book, and mm -hmm. then I could say, look, I don't have a PhD, but I wrote the most popular physics book of 2021. Uh, you know, Brian Keating's was the most popular of 2020. And uh, maybe I could teach at an online course, yeah. uh, online university. We were number one in Lebanon, as I told you a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Um, uh, so yes, I actually take that, taken that advice. And now I'm doing a TikTok course on advanced uh, general relativistic quantum mechanics. So I, that's a very right. brilliant idea, by the yeah. way. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so by the way, that's idea sex. So, so many people think, oh, there's only one path to be a TikTok influencer, which is I got to be, I got to dance like a 13 year old girl no. um, or I've got to lip sync really well. But I, in fact, I, weird things made of glass and I, and I do those and, and that, that freaks people out. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, 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 in fact, actually you could be an enormous TikTok. And by the way, the eight, the average age of people on TikTok is going up every single day. So yeah. a 13 year old, that audience has gone down percentage of TikTok and the uh, 45 to 55 year old audience has gone up. So, mm -hmm. so you could be this enormous, famous TikTok physics influencer and be doing legit physics and explaining it on TikTok. How much so of that is, is first, is first mover advantage? While well, I look up your TikTok account, uh, mm -hmm. how much of that is like, well, TikTok is you, you could be the, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson of TikTok because he's not on it and he's busy with Twitter and he has 13 million followers on Twitter, but uh, I'll never get that. Um, do you think that's first mover advantage? Like TikTok is viral. You're kind of leveraging the virality sex of, of physics and you know, it's first mover. It's, it's a little bit first mover, but, but not, you know, it is a combination of many things. It's, it's a little bit first mover. It's a little bit which influencers like you. So that's kind of like a, mm -hmm. like a luck, the luck factor. Yep. And then there's just the quality of the content. That's just as important as you don't have to be first movers. The, the quality of the content is probably the most important because at some point, if you're consistent with high quality content, some major influencer will bless you with their, hey, check out Brian Keating's page. And then suddenly you just get enormous numbers of, of users. Yeah, because I mean, I've, seen, I've seen famous you know, comedians on TikTok and they get nowhere. And then I see someone who just hits the right zeitgeist and quickly they get a million followers. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could easily double my my TikTok following by just uh, having one person join. Actually, maybe you'll join my TikTok, Dr. Brian Keating. I'll, um, I'll, I'll join it. And you're James Altucher on TikTok and uh, Jay Altucher on Twitter. I want to get in because it's not so often I get to uh, pick the brains of somebody who's had so many careers as you have. Uh, I want to I, I want to go into comedy right now. Do you still have some time, James? Yeah, of course. Okay, awesome. Uh, so before you were, you, you talked earlier about your uh, TEDx experience. For my TEDx, I wanted to have the experience of bombing in front of a high, maybe low stakes, but in a kind of high pressure situation uh, before I went and failed potentially on TEDx. I wasn't super nervous because I give a lot of lectures. It's my job, right? Uh, uh, but it's different. It's a different set of skills giving a lecture. First of all, you're naked. You're without a podium. You've got this time limit, this TikTok in your ear, like 15 minutes. It's like, what happens at 15 minutes? And my speaking coach said, they shoot these blow darts at you. Uh, you know, <laughs> you had a nice coach, I think. I mean, my coach <laughs> was not as nice. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, you know, so I wanted to have the experience of, of being in a, you know, in front of an audience with, that's hostile potentially, or just not exposed to me and not, not positive. Like my, I'm not saying my students are positive. Uh, so I went to the comedy store here in La Jolla and I did a, a tight, a tight, uh, 10 milliseconds. No, I did, I did a tight two minutes. Uh, I had a, a oh, that's great. Of, so what, what, how did you, did you say to them, Hey, I'm doing a TEDx San Diego. Would you let me do some time? And they say, uh, all right, two minutes. <laughs> No, no, no. It's, it's, it's worse than that. I didn't, I didn't say it at all. In fact, I, I just went up there. I had my wife there. And uh, because I am, uh, it, it, you know, I go to an, or, uh, you know, kind of uh, links to be associated with the, with the Jewish community. And I, I had a rabbi there and, and I was just like, I can't curse. And it's really hard not to curse in front of like your rabbi, right? So, so I did, uh, I wanted to do a clean set and I was the last person at open mic night. I had two minutes to go and I, and I had to be clean. So I went up there with, I tried a little shtick. I went up there with a tweed jacket with, with suede elbow, you know, and I took out a bubble pipe and, and I did some jokes and, and 
you know, and, and they were all clean. And I was the last person, I was the only person who got a laugh. And I want to talk to you about that. Cause it's kind of like, uh, and so, so I should say, um, you are a uh, owner or co-owner or a full owner of com of stand up New York. Co-owner. I own about half of it. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I can't wait to check it out. Uh, next time I'm in New York city, uh, later this year and, uh, maybe do a set if you have an open night night, but, sure. but, but the, but the point about comedy and uh, so I wanted to have this experience. It was a little difficult because everyone there is drunk. And so I, I made a, I made a new rule that, you know, all my students have to have the two drink minimum before each lecture and things have gotten a lot better for me. Uh, yeah. and so we did this, by the I way, did, that's a joke. Yeah, no, I know. The, Actually, the, I, pipe, I, the pipe's not a joke. That's a joke. Yeah, yeah. I had a couple of jokes. I had one about uh, a professor because I was like, I'm the, I'm the, you know, the stand up cosmic. Oh, no. the, the, it would be a joke further. That's really just a premise. It'd be a joke further if like, and then I was in the middle of talking about the Big Bang and, and they, uh, one student started heckling me and you'd have to, the, the actual punchline would have to be a good heckle. So yeah, I, I'd that's have to right. think about that. I want to get into that because I want, my, I, have a, I have a philosophy that no uh, comedy is not victimless. Like there has to be a victim. Sometimes it's you, sometimes it's the audience, sometimes the heckler, sometimes you're being heckled. But anyway, so I had some jokes. I had like, um, I'm writing a book right now uh, called The Timely History of Briefs instead of a brief history of time and that, that, that flop. But, but I went through this whole, this whole bit about like this kid who takes a class on ornithology. And have you ever heard this? Just stop me if you've heard this joke, uh, as they say. Uh, but uh, this kid's taking, taking my class. And when I was uh, in college, I was taking a class in ornithology. And I wanted to learn all about it. And I learned about the birds. And then the final exam, all the professor was asking me was like, here's this bird track print on the ground. Identify the bird. Here's the bird print footprint on the ground. Identify the, I'm like, what the hell is this? This is such BS. We're not learning anything about their, their migration habits, their mating habits. You know, it wasn't anything that we learned about in the stupid final exam. So I went up in the middle of class. I handed in the final exam. I didn't put my name on it. I stormed out. The professor reaches up and says, wait a second. Wait, you didn't put your name on it. And I said to the professor, here, figure it out. And I put up my foot and, and it, it got a laugh. It was actually, you know, people, people laughed at that joke. Uh, right, because, <laughs> so there, there's a case where, so act outs, that's called an act out. Yeah. And oh, really? Okay. Out, it has a name. <laughs> yeah. Act outs are funny. Like if you ever see like, um, you know, uh, like a, a Louis C.K. special, he's often doing act outs. Like he has the one joke where he's teaching his, is a famous joke. He's teaching his daughter uh, Monopoly, but it's too hard for her really. It's like very emotional Monopoly. And so he's acting like her voice and then his voice. And so that he's acting out both roles. Ah, uh, I see. While he explains Monopoly to his daughter. And act outs and voices are funny. So if you ever listen to Jim Gaffigan, part of his joke always is like he has the voice, he plays the voice right. of the audience a little bit. Like, is he Whoa. doing that joke yeah, again? Right. And <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> right. so is he going to stop talking about horses Hot yet? Hot pockets. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, but, but uh, there's all these different things. So you did an act out, which, which is funny. And, um, but you know, a, a big common thing, which, which is like you started to do with the physics class example with the two drink minimum is you can it's it's like an idea sex thing you conflate two different areas and oddly connect the dots so for instance um i saw someone the other day do a, a joke um where you ever notice that you know of, of, of course we care about women's equal rights ever notice that the best food in the world comes from country women early it's like no one ever says hey honey let's Let's go out for Canadian tonight. No, you go out for the Middle East, <laughs> Middle right. Eastern food where they chop off women's hands. So like, so it's like you're conflating these two concepts that are not really connected, but there is this odd, real connect the dots moment. And now that's often the construction of a, of a joke. So like you were basically turning your physics class with the two drink minimum into a comedy club. So I felt like that was kind of going in the direction of a joke. Yeah. And, um, Whereas the other example, the act out, that's more of a, like a sketch type of joke. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. But, like a bit, uh, a routine. Yeah. And, and I actually, one of the things I mentioned in the, in the two minutes or whatever, I was like, um, as speaking of Louis CK, cause any, I know you've had him on, I know he's a friend of yours, uh, but, but I like, I, want, I, I haven't had like, him on. I haven't had him on. Oh, okay. I, him on I, I thought you did. Are you, you've, you've been in a room with him or whatever. Anyway. And someone's like, Oh, I have so much respect for him. You know that he writes a new routine every year. I'm like, you know what it's called? If I only write one new routine every year, it's, it's called unemployment. You know, it's, right. I, they're just like, I mean, the standards for, and I, he's funny. I know he's controversial. I'm not, I'm not, but like, 
that that was the power. Like if I only come up with one idea or one hour's worth of speeches, you know how many speeches I give or how many podcasts you give? I mean, uh, it's, it's, it is very hard. And that's actually what I wanted to get into, you know, like the basis of comedy, I think is, uh, you know, and I kind of mentioned that earlier, like I got into like, how do I know I made an impact in someone's life? Like, it's kind of cruel to teach a kid that there's four planets just to see if they will remember what Brian Keating said. Like, you know, I kind of mentioned right. that. And I said, like, you know, the dinosaurs were killed by, you know, by they think it's killed by di by by the meteor falling. But really, uh, you know, it's because their arms are so freaking short, they couldn't cover their mouth and they sneeze and you know, whatever. And I went through this whole thing. And again, I'm like, these people just heard a woman talking about her I'll just say monthly cycle and like with the most vulgar language in the world. And then like this other guy, you know, and it was like F bomb, F bomb, F bomb. And like, hi Rabbi, you know, like it was very challenging. And I don't think I'd ever want to do something with, with a, with a, you know, like, I just feel like that is demeaning to like, like that you have to use the app. Like it loses its currency. I mean, yeah, what do you I think about you. cursing? And and, mo and, and most comics, I would, uh, not all of them, maybe it's half and half. I don't know, but most comics don't really, you know, rely on uh, the curse words to, to for for the the humor. They might rely on curse words for timing, like they need to throw in a word as just like a beat be between the premise and the the punchline. So, and then you know what this effing guy did? Like it just they needed that extra two syllables or something. Right. But, um, uh, and also effing has the K sound in it, and that's funny, yeah. allegedly, right? Yeah, like, but Seinfeld's totally clean. Jim Gaffigan. Yeah, Gaffigan's totally clean. Yeah, he performed in front of the Pope. But, you know, speaking of the writing every uh, new routine every year, the, the big argument actually was Seinfeld and Louis C.K. because Seinfeld would not write a new routine ever. Mm. And, mm -hmm. in fact, I mean, I think now he does in his last special. But the last time I saw Seinfeld perform, he actually did a joke I remember him doing in 1992. So, you know, but Louis C.K. would never have done that. Um, and, and Dave Chappelle doesn't do that. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think most comedians now rewrite quite a bit. And certainly after this, the weird thing about this pandemic and lockdown is you kind of have to rewrite. Every comedian now has to rewrite all their material. Right. None of the old material works. Like J Jerry Seinfeld now has a whole new routine about going going out like you, you you know let's get ready to go out and then we're gonna go out where he, he makes fun of the word out and then and then he reverses it and he's like okay but when are we going back and like <laughs> now i gotta get back and now i gotta go back to the car and then he but now that that joke doesn't even make con contextual sense anymore in in even after the lockdown right. so so you know everybody's got to rewrite their material now so it's a it's a little different story but yeah that was a big shift in comedy when it was clear Louis C.K. was was writing a whole new set every year, and Dave Chappelle does like three or four a year now. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, it's 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 nonstop. So I want to talk a little about the physics of comedy and and really relate that to what we talked about earlier, which is this notion of entropy or surprise and, and combinatorics, so to speak. And you know, I was thinking like, why is it so hard to make people laugh? Uh, and I think the and let me know if you agree with it. Like it's so easy to make people cry. Like the difficulty gap between making somebody cry, like all I have to show you is this mother who's about to give birth or gave birth and she had cancer. And like I'm starting to tear up right now. Like it's so easy to make the world cry or make yeah. them feel negative emotions. Well, think of um, if, if you listen to a song with minor chords, you're going to feel like crying. Yeah. And, but, but, and, and I was relating that because like the old joke is like, how do you, how do you turn someone funny uh, into someone who's you know completely unfunny and it's not really a joke but but it's an observation it's like ask them to explain their jokes like yeah, if you ever see like oh uh here's uh what's his name jim carrey and he's on the tonight show or whatever and they're like why are you so funny tell us why you're so funny and that's like the least funny he'll ever be in their entire right. life like because right. you can't but like i don't but have to explain to you why it's it, sad if a mother dies like right after she gives birth it's like so it's like entropy there's more ways to be unhappy and, and this is i was thinking about the second law of thermodynamics and like why is it that when you mix milk into coffee you never see like a spontaneous separation of coffee and milk uh, because there's almost an infinite number of combinatorics permutations where milk and coffee are equally blended but there's only one state where there's half coffee half milk and there's almost like an infinite number of ways to be sad and to be emotional, but there's only like really very precious few ways to be funny. And like, I don't think most comics are that funny. Like I might not laugh. I agree with you. Yeah. So, I mean, so, I watch, I watch as, as an owner of a comedy club and a performer, I've watched maybe a thousand different comedians. Yeah. Most are just not funny. And, and I think, you know, like you said, it's hard to, there's so many different like theories of comedy. Like, and there's so many different, 
um, there's no one answer, right? Like I talked about conflating two ideas. You talked a little bit about doing an act out and then there's, you know, storytelling. Uh, but, but, but yeah, there's always an element of surprise. Like there's some tension that's created and there's a pacing of that tension. So the tension lasts just long enough, but not too long that you then release the tension. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, then you can co co use these other things like conflating two ideas or doing an act out, doing mm -hmm. voices. And, um, but yeah, there's no one theory of comedy, but maybe it's a good point that you're putting energy into the tension and the more, you, there's a certain amount of energy you put into that tension so that when it's, you know, it's potential energy yeah. and when it becomes kinetic, that's when- it's a yeah, yeah that, exactly. That's and that's what I was thinking, like, and I wonder, I want to get your take on this too. Like, where is it hardest to be funny when people expect you to be funny? And when is it, and, and maybe this is because the inherent tension in the situation. I don't know about you, but like, I've had, unfortunately, like many, you know, how to speak at a funeral. And, and actually, like, there are more funny funeral speakers, you know, like giving a eulogy than I think there are comedians. <laughs> well, that's there's because so that's much a, tension, right? Right. Yeah, that's yeah. also why, like, it's probably funnier to get a laugh at a, uh, TED talk than in a comedy club because I mean it's hard sorry it's hard probably easier to get a laugh yeah. at a TED talk than That's a comedy right. club because the, the you know or but let's take a funeral very specifically there's so much tension already you don't have to put as much energy in like there's all this tense energy anyway and no one's released it right the, the rabbi doesn't release it the mm -hmm. other you know congregants don't release right. it uh so if you release if you give people an excuse to release that energy just a little bit, like you open up the valve a little bit, it's, it, it's an explosive laugh. It's like, oh, finally, I've been holding in all this potential energy. I get to be kinetic for a second. And in a comedy club, first they're expecting just nonstop kinetic energy. So mm -hmm. you have to really like- And there's no tension. Up. It's like, I'm out for a good time and like, I'm expecting you, like you let me down if it'll be tense if you're not funny, jerk, you know? Right, and I mean, and that, that's why- Like a magic why, show, I expect to be fooled, right? Right, um, but still you expect to be surprised. Like it's no good if it's too easy for you to figure out, if, if, if you know, and then there's, um, you know, there's the, the, the act and then you think it's over, but then there's the other surprise, you know, that they always do at, at the end. But uh, so comedy and magic has have similar features, uh, but more dexterity with with magic. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, no, with 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 comedy, it's all about you can't. And and this was always my problem. Like you, when I when I first started out, is that I would try to tell a classic joke, but they knew it wasn't true. I was just telling like some dumb joke that had a classic structure, but because they knew it wasn't true, I wasn't building the tension. But if I if I said you know a joke like um, uh, 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 you know, something like, oh, I don't want my daughter to go to college. So I said to her, like, you know, Josie, don't spend, don't spend, th you're a young, pretty girl, don't spend $300,000 just to have sex nonstop for four years. They should be paying you you that's the, the point. And then someone might be upset, like you can't say I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, she's a whore. <laughs> and uh, so like you could then, you know, like you build up this tension, like, is he really adv giving that advice to his daughter? And then you, then you, there's all these different directions you could go. Like I can act like I'm clueless, like, oh no, you're right. I should just say she's a whore. Or, uh, uh, or, or, I could, or, or I could say, listen, I'm just being a good father. So like I'm, I'm and, then, and then I'm playing the role of like a clueless, an unreliable narrator, which I'm sort of giving good advice in a, in a weird, uh, bizarro world, but uh, I have uh, this odd way of releasing the tension of it. And so, you know, you do, again, it's a matter of like finding that right point of energy where things are about to boil. Is Everyone's thinking like, this guy is the worst father in the world. And then I have to like break that tension somehow. So they see that oh, it's, it's a joke, sort of. They're still not even sure. And I could, I could keep diving into that. And, and you know, then, um, you know, maybe maybe my daughter can say, "Oh, uh, you know, climate change. Uh, what do you think of that?" And I'm like, "Well, what you know, what do you think of it?" And, and oh, you know, Molly, she'll say to me, "You know, my teacher says your my your grandchild, my grandchildren are going to be dead by the time you know in the next forty years. Like the, the world's going to de destroy be destroyed by climate." 
And I could say, you know, Molly, your grandchildren, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, right. I don't know the name of my great, great grandparents. What the hell am I know? I'm never going to be. Yeah. Like, grand- I don't <laughs> even care about you that much. Like, why would I care about people I, ha- I haven't even father. met yet? Yeah, right. I can see this is going to be our Father's Day episode of the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, well, I have five kids, so I'm, right. I have nonstop material from, from my kids. And, uh, and then, you know, there's a lot of material being Jewish and depending on how you're raised. And, and then there's a lot of material with politics and, and so on. So there's Yeah, just, anything that brings up tension. And, and so for me... I and, kinda, and then, by the way, just like a simple example, this is like a basic example with coronavirus conflating two things. I'm not going to get coronavirus. I'm waiting for coronavirus 2.0 because it'll have a better camera, better Wi-Fi. You know, so now <laughs> mulligan the coronavirus mulligan, right? Right. Like I'm conflating then how versions of technology with this deadly pandemic. Right. And so can you imagine the was, Netflix Netflix specials once we know about co- coronavirus? Right. <laughs> so so like and then but then I'm creating the tension like how can he say he's not going to get it? Like does he not care? Does he think it's not real? Like you know and they start getting angry. But then you you get into this you connect the dots in this weird way with the technology world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think the thing that appeals to me, so I kind of like reverse hacked it because I found that it made me better, not, not better for Ted, you know, for the Ted talk. But then when I came back to being, you know, my, my, my professor job, uh, because that's a situation that's, that's tense, right? Cause kids don't know if they should laugh. They, maybe they don't want to laugh. You know, I'll make up jokes, stupid physics jokes, even if they're puns, which, you know, I, I used to have it, you know, a, an opinion that puns were like the lowest form of humor, but, and I think that's common, but actually I think a good pun, you know, it, uh, is, is a pretty beautiful thing. Like Jim Simon's, it's, it's funny. One of his meta skills is clearly like his comedy. And he told me a joke, not on this podcast. He's told me he's, I mean, he was known uh, for being, you know, a jokester. Uh, and uh, he told me once, like he was like, going through this, this bit. And I didn't realize he was telling a joke until like, he just, cause he's like so serious and you're in the room with this guy's a billionaire. Right. So there's tension, right. It's building up. He's like, you know, it's really hard. He's telling me it's, it's like, you know, I got two houses and it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's trouble enough just having one house. And once I need to have over, uh, you know, a technician and, uh, and, and I thought to them, you know, I said like, well, the plumber, you know, you're gonna fix the house. It's so expensive. Like he came back, he did the, he fixed the, fixed the house. And he said, uh, you know, the, the, the toilet's now working. That'll be $300. And Jim's like, what the hell? Like, I run a hedge fund. You know, that's that's three hundred dollars for a freaking a freaking toilet. Uh, I don't even charge that much. You know, my my fees. And the plumber said, yeah, you know, I used to charge pretty low rates when I was a hedge fund manager. <laughs> like Jim Simon's like stand up New York. I, mean, I think I'm so gonna that's, go. So that's that's funny. And um, <laughs> uh, I, I was trying. I was thinking of one. Um, but anyway, it's just it, again, it's all just a matter of. Like that was a case where they're arguing. So there's some tension there in the story and they just got to, you know, they conflated the two occupations and reversed it. So there was a reversal. There's often a reversal in, in uh, at the end of a joke. It's like yeah. completely the opposite of what you think. And then that's how that, that's how that, that surprise, works. Yeah. Manifest the surprise. Exactly. So, yeah. But just thinking about it, like, what, what do you think, you know, when I, when I'm up there, I don't, I'm not expected to be funny. So even something that's a corny pun, or I'll say, you know, the unit of, of luminosity divided by area is flux. And I'll say like, what do you think the unit is? What the flux? You know, just whatever, like stupid. And like they'll laugh at, you know, maybe they're laughing because I'm going to give them, you know, control their entire destiny or not. But, uh, but I wonder, you know, what about this podium, like having a podium, is a barrier and that's part of the reason i felt like more naked when i did the tedx talk um like do you think it's uh, it's kind of taboo to use a podium or like worst case scenario like using like using note cards like adam carolla who's a friend of a friend came to san diego last november and we went and go saw him and he was like working on bits and he's like reading note cards he's like nah, i don't like this one and i was like is that it just wasn't as funny. Like he's a funny guy. No, but that just, he, but he's doing that on purpose. Because, no, I know, I know that. But, yeah. but like, I was thinking like, what if everybody used no card? Like, would we just accept it as like, that's just the way comedians work. Just like rap, no, you know, it, musicians it, it, use hats. Yeah. If everybody used it, it wouldn't work because mm-hmm. they're specifically doing an experiment the way a scientist would do an experiment. They're, they're, um, if they get even the slightest reaction, even though their performance is deliberately so poor, mm-hmm. then they know that they can work on that material. Mm-hmm. Because let's say, and who knows these percentages, we're making this up, but let's say 50% of a joke's humor is the way you deliver it on stage. And, you know, like if you had, let's say the, the joke that was the act out where you showed the professor your feet, 
what if, what if you said, what if you had just said, look, you're just going to have to look at my feet then that wouldn't have been as funny. You needed right. the act out. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like Stephen Wright is this comedian known for his yeah, very dark. tight one liners, but yeah. he's also has this very droll way. So, so if, if he had just said very excitedly and very fast, like, uh, it's a small world, but I wouldn't want to paint it. It's not as funny, and for him, uh, mm -hmm. he does it in this droll way. Right, it's a small. World. I lived at a. I lived on a one way, you know, a dead end street. Right, like yeah, like his droll <laughs> way right. is like he creates this persona, and the delivery is is that for him it might be well I don't know the writing on that's hard, but it's at least fifty percent is the delivery. Louis yeah. C.K. does so many act outs; it's half as the delivery. Dave Chappelle is huge on the delivery. All, all the comedians you see Netflix specials for, it's huge on the delivery. Uh, that, that's such a big part of it. And, what about and also, you have to be, the weird thing too is, you have to be charming. Like mm -hmm. the audience has to like you. So um, one comedian, he'll go up on stage on 9-11 and you know, he'll, he'll just look at the audience, he'll stare at them. And he says, it's 9-11 and you're in a comedy club? You <laughs> pieces of shit. But, <laughs> He's so, he makes it come across as very charming in a weird way. Right. So he's insulting them. If he just was like sort of an annoying guy in his look or his presentation, they wouldn't laugh. They would just hate him. And uh, yeah, so that, that's part of it as well. There's all these different components that are a part of it, which is why out of all the skills I've ever had to learn, you know, um, uh, you know I haven't had to be a, a, a Nobel Prize level genius physicist, but I'm chess master, programmer, investor, uh, uh, writer, written a bunch of books, uh, you know, all, all sorts of things. Yeah. But comedian is, is the heart. I mean, I've been doing this like five, six years and maybe more. And, um, you know, uh, from beginning to end, I became a top chess player. I was in New Jersey's, you know, when I was in champion, high school, yeah. I was the junior champion in New Jersey. Yeah. Did that in a year. Um, but comedy is like six years in and, I could see vast vistas in the, in the future of just things I need to learn. And then yeah. of course there's the things I don't know that I need to learn. Right. The Dunning Krieger. Uh, I mean, I mean, I've toured with this guy, Tony Woods, who's Dave Chappelle acknowledged Tony Woods in the Mark Twain awards as Tony Woods was, was Dave Chappelle's mentor. Wow. So Tony and I travel around together right before the lockdown, we did yeah. five different cities in, in, the in the Netherlands. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so I had, I was able to see firsthand, this is Dave Chappelle's mentor. And, and I just learned so much. It was incredible, but it also shows just how much there is to, to go. Yeah, there is. And there's so many similarities between, you know, even the profession that I have, it's, it's not so dissimilar. Remember most of my time is not spent, you know, stroking my non-existent beard, pondering the universe. It's like, how do I get this truckload of concrete up the mountain? How do I get the funding agencies to give us a, a COVID gap supplement? You know, how do I convince these other more brilliant scientists that this is an idea with trout? You know, so it's all these meta skills stacked on top of each other. But I do find that, you know, we don't expect professors to be, you know, stand up comedians. And I'm not saying that you have to be, you know, to, to, to be successful, but I think, yeah, there is a chemistry there is. Uh, and it's not like manipulative chemistry. I, I think, you know, sometimes like a magician will do something and, you know, Jerry Seinfeld's, you know, famous lines, you know, it's like, what does a magician do? It's like, look in here, you're a jerk. Hey, look at this, you idiot. You know, like, like that's manipulative kind of charisma or, 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 you know, presence in a way. Um, but, uh, but I wonder, you know, kind of combining idea sex here for a second, you mentioned COVID and we talked about comedy. Uh, do you think that COVID, sorry, do you think that comedy would work Zoom, let's say the Zoom app, you know, Zoom, uh, stand up New York or sit down New York, you know, where you're on stage, but you're, you know, you're coming into the audience and, and uh, on an app, there's no audience. It's not like a Netflix special. You're well, just like beaming. Like, what do you think about that idea? Well, every comedy club has been doing that this past oh, really? oh, three sorry. or four months. Yeah. So there's so been huge, been like watching. a lot of uh, Zoom comedy events. I've been, of course, invited to go on a whole bunch of them. I have not done it just because, and I haven't watched one just because I actually don't really, yeah. I, for me, I don't think it'd be fun. I think for mm -hmm. me is the visceral reaction of the audience. I really enjoy. I mean, I do Instagram lives almost every day. So I, I try material, but even then you just see a bunch of hearts come up and, uh, or you see a smiley face. It just doesn't feel... The, the same, although I enjoy being funny on those things, but it's not the same experience. And if I'm going to watch comedy, there's a big advantage to being in person because you, then you get the energy of, you feel, not only if you're performing, but even if you're in the audience, you feel the energy of the audience. So if someone's really funny, that's like, I watched Louis CK for years 
uh, on YouTube. And I thought, oh, this guy's funny. But then the first time I saw him perform in Radio City Music Hall, I was laughing so hard. I <laughs> thought I was going to have to leave the room. Yeah. And uh, it's just a difference, like, in person. It's just yeah. it's much – and, again, it's all related to energy, and it's related to likability, and – it's Chemistry. related to the tension in there and everybody's tense around you all of a sudden. And then they burst out laughing at the same time. And so it's just, it's just different. And then, you know, also there's, a, there's different philosophies like Dave Chappelle's philosophy and he's a very funny comedian. He's the best, but his philosophy is better to be interesting than funny. So his most recent release was not funny at all. Or there's mm-hmm. like three seconds of humor and there's mostly, he was talking about, you know, George Floyd recent events and so yeah, on. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. uh, uh, so, but for him is, be- is, is better to be interesting than funny. Mm-hmm. Then on the reverse side, you have, in terms of the tension, you have Andy Kaufman. All he would do would be to increase the tension until it was unbearable. And then he would release it. He wouldn't tell jokes or anything. Right. It just was about the energy and the tension. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If you enjoyed this episode of Into the Impossible... Please subscribe, comment, share, rate, and review. For a chance to win a free copy of our most recent guest's newest book, send a screenshot of your review to info at imagine.ucsd.edu. We appreciate hearing from you and are always open to your suggestions for future episodes. For more information, go to imagination.ucsd.edu. Find us on Twitter at Imagine UCSD. Watch us on YouTube, listen on iTunes. Into the Impossible is a production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination in the Division of Physical Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. Eric Veery, Director. Brian Keating, Co-Director. 